Welcome to God First. I'm Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr., pastor of the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. And I am standing here in front of this beautiful sign which reads, I do set my bow. It shall be for a covenant between me and the earth. A covenant that the God of the Bible made with the earth, as a matter of fact, with all flesh, that he would never again flood the earth with water. As you know, the Lord flooded the earth with water as a result of the wickedness of man in the days of Noah. But look at the grace of God. He put a rainbow in the sky to remind himself not to flood the earth with water again and to remind us that he would not flood the earth with water again. As a matter of fact, if you go to the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 4, you find again the rainbow appearing over the throne of God. But the truth is today, when we see these beautiful seven colors, we do not think of the love of God. We do not think of the Bible. We do not think of Jesus Christ, but we think more of the LGBTQ community, a community in which people live a lifestyle that is contrary to scripture. Well, my friends, I don't think that we should give up these beautiful colors. I think that we should take back the rainbow. During our FAM conference a month ago, back in June, I preached a message entitled, I am not ashamed. We had a night that was set aside entitled, uh, Take Back the Rainbow Night. I want you to join me, hear the word of the Lord, and you decide whether or not we should take back the rainbow. Praise the Lord, and I will join you at the close of the message. Night, God wants to anoint us. Praise the Lord to to revive us and then and then give us a revive us and, and revive us in a manner where we stay revived. Praise the Lord. I don't believe revival ought to last a day. Sometimes our, 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 our being revived lasts to the end of service. Then when service is out, something happens and we lose that joy again. But I believe God can give us something that will keep us. Say amen. And you have to fight to keep from losing it. Or not to give away the joy so easily. And let the devil erase from our minds so quickly what the Lord has done. Father, bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am not ashamed. Let's go directly into this message tonight. Someone uh, said this, and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, someone wrote and said, Human frailties must be recognized in all human endeavors. People get tired, discouraged, bored, and disillusioned with the result that both they and their work suffer. Isn't it amazing how people can be excited to do a thing at first, but over time, if you're not careful, you get tired. Praise the Lord, a little bored, bored, you want to do something else. It loses, you know, its luster when you were first appointed to that position. You dot every I, crossed every T, and looped every L. A few years later, you do just enough to say it's done. Praise the Lord. Times past, you wanted to make it special. Now we almost, hmm, you better thank God that I showed up. The work suffer. There, there are those who say, I've been in the way for a long time. And now they're actually just that. Because they've lost their zeal, lost their excitement for the things of God. Oh, can you remember how excited you were when you first got saved and first learned how to do the holy day? God, you, you, if, if they act like they were going to play the organ, you were jumping up. Now the praise team can't move you. We got an organ, a lead, uh, a keyboard, 
drums, bass, guitar, a horn section, and a drum machine. And some of us still. You have to ask yourself, what happened? Amen. When did you, when did you get tired? What happened? Praise the Lord. At the time of this writing, time Paul wrote the book of Romans, Paul had been actively engaged in his ministry for 30 hectic, energy-sapping years. The book of Romans was not written by a novice who just met Christ, but a 30-year veteran. In Jesus Christ. Man who had gone through some things. There was no lack. For the stripes. On his back. He would had experiences. By the time he wrote this book. Praise the Lord. He had endured hardships. Hardship. Triumphs. Excitement. And tragedy. He had endured enough of those things. To last most people. A half a dozen lifetimes. Paul's life was one that was dogged by persistent problems that followed him. That was a group called Judaizers that no matter where he went, they followed him. And their job was to undo everything that he did. If he went to a city and preached Christ, their job was to go and to unpreach Christ. He was beaten multiple times and left for dead. For a while in his ministry, he ministered in no man's land. The saints were afraid to receive him because he had killed Christians. The Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, turned their back on him because he accepted Christ. And there's this man, praise the Lord, who had a zeal in him and a desire and an experience with Christ. Here he is 30 years later writing a letter having gone through a many of triumphs and tragedies and we find in this letter, hear me tonight, I won't preach long, that his enthusiasm for Christ had not abated one bit. 30 years later, still excited. 30 years later, still revive. Praise the Lord. And, and also, when you read his travel plans, and back in that day there were no first class flights and airplanes and cushy cars and uh, drivers to take you from point A to point B. As we study his travel plans, it's easy to forget that he was almost 60 years old at this time. 60 years old almost and ramping up for the next journey to go and minister the word of the Lord. Having gone on multiple missionary journeys, here he is now writing to the saints at Rome, saying that it, it was my plans, brethren. I don't want you to be ignorant. I had uh, been trying to get to you. But until now, not until now am I able to come. And when you study the text and, and you study it seriously, you see the excitement uh, that he had and the sincere desire that he had to go and to minister to the saints at Rome. One writer said, notice the vigor and the vision of his thought and expression. Verse 13, now I would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes, I propose to come to you. And, and uh, here's why I wanted to come, that I might have some fruit among you. I don't, I haven't tried to get to you so I could get there uh, to be on vacation. He said, I wanted to win some souls in Rome. Praise the Lord. Ah. Uh, I might get some amens after a while, but I won't get many talking about winning souls because studies have shown 
that a very small portion of Christians today have any desire whatsoever to share their faith. Most of us do not witness. Witnessing does not cross our mind. We don't think about witnessing uh, to someone when they're in a room dying. Most believers have no desire today to share their faith. I wonder when was the last time you witnessed to someone? When was the last time missionaries, elders, Spirit-filled, when was the last time you told someone about the cross? Witnessing is not inviting someone to come to aim or to fam. Or I'm a member of Upper Room. I'm a member of this church or that church. Come to my church. Don't not do that, but that's not witnessing. That's inviting someone to church. When was the last time you longed to produce I want to win somebody. Or should I rephrase it, when was the first time? You see, the spirit of Laodicea is indeed alive and well. We're, we're stained by it and we don't even know it. Even the most on fire for Christ amongst us do not witness. We don't have that burning desire to share the faith. One preacher uh, said one time uh, about uh, another minister who uh, in his life he witnessed every day. And I believe he was talking about Spurgeon's. I may be incorrect on that. But one night he went to bed. And while lying in the bed, it dawned on him that he had not shared his faith with anybody that day. He got up out of his bed on a cold rainy night, went out on the street corner and stood there in the night until someone came by. And when that person came by, he shared his faith. Then he eventually went to bed. Most of us don't have it like that. Isn't it amazing that 30 years after he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, 60 years of age, there is a desire in him after having started churches all over Europe, after having gone on several missionary journeys, yet there is a desire to go out and to witness to the saints, to the sinners in Rome so that he could put his mark on Rome. Praise the Lord. I wonder, is there any place in society that we have placed our mark uh, there as a result of sharing our faith? Are you with me? You have to admit, it seems like he had a different kind of salvation than what we have today. Most believers today, we are, really, we, we are complacent. We are consumed with ourselves. We are consumed. Pray for me now. I, I'm, I'm like Bishop Hines and, and uh, Al Cleveland. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. Uh, we are consumed with making it. Getting our next blessing, but not with winning souls. Some of us are going to have some thin Going to have some crowns in heaven with no stones on them. But Pastor, I just want to get to heaven. Well, that's what you're saying now. But when you get there, and the Lord is handing out rewards. See, we haven't seen God's rewards. We don't know the joys of the Lord. Amen. It's got to be special. The things that the Lord is going to, to, to give to the believers, the believers' judgment when he gives out rewards for our works. Some of us, praise the Lord, going to be, you know, some going to be like the man who just graduated. Others graduated with honor. Some of us was at the top of the class, valedictorious, solidatory, so forth and so on. Uh, uh, summa cum laude, cum laude. Some of us just going to be O-laude. We got there, 
Praise the Lord. I mean, we're going to be glad we're there, but, but, but I'm telling you, when we get there, we're going to want uh, rewards. They not cross your mind now, but we will then. And there's nothing as precious in the sight of the Lord as winning souls. Amen. The Bible says they that win souls are going to shine as stars forever and ever. The Bible says he that winneth souls is wise. Here we are reading the words of a 60-year-old man, a 30-year veteran in Christ. Most of our, most, most people I know in their 60s in the Lord uh, have cooled off. Most of them I know now, they, uh, they're sideline people. Amen. Not all. We have some, uh, some exceptions, but most by that time, well, I've seen it all. I'm saved. I, I understand this. Praise the Lord. Nothing God does excites me anymore because I've been in the Lord on a child for a long time. But you've lost it. You've lost it. Praise the Lord. You, 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 you're a good deacon, and a good elder, good pastor. I know of pastors who've lost it. I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. a year ago, uh, 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 and a pastor stood up and said, in my city in, in California, uh, there's, a, there's a young man who comes to my church, and he dresses like a woman, and I just got tired of resisting it, and so I just, I just put a bathroom in the church just for him because I'm, I'm tired. What, what else are we going to do? What can we do? And, and we said to that man, you're tired. You need to quit. It's time to go home. Seriously, it's time to go. Either get revived or give it up because you've lost your fight. There came a time when they had to pull David off the battlefield. Amen. Amen. And sometimes many of us who've lost the fight, we don't give the other young people a chance to get their fight because uh, as, as, since we've lost the fight but we're in charge, we're going to make sure service don't last but 15 minutes. We're going to cut out all this shouting because we've shouted enough. We've danced enough. We've hollered enough. But when you were young in Christ, you wanted to shout all night. We used to sing songs back in the day. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, when I think of how he died out on Calvary, I could dance, 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 dance all night. Then we get excited all night, all night. But over time, over time, We've gone from all night to, it don't take all that. Matter of fact, many of, us, uh, many of us in holiness sound like Baptists now. Doesn't take all that. People have other things to do. People have lives they want to live. No, 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 what has happened is we've lost our fight. A 60-year-old man, knowing that when he travels from Jerusalem to Rome, that for the most part, he's walking. When he does uh, take public transportation, the, the ships and things that he caught, they were not luxury liners. Mm -mm, it wasn't nice like that. Praise the Lord. Oftentimes when he did ride, it was on donkeys. Walking up and down rocky terrain going through hostile territories, but driven by a desire not to get a new house. I don't have any help tonight. Not to get a new blessing, but to win souls. This man says, I want fruit in Rome. I want to reach some Gentiles. I want to reach some other Gentiles in Rome. And then he says something that really speaks to the intensity and the fervency of his commitment to Christ. He says something that I find amazing. He says, I am ghetto. God Almighty. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm going I'm to holler in a minute. But he says, I'm a debtor. This, this debtor expresses an uncommon level of intensity. I have a question. Do any of us feel indebted? 
What about you, youth workers? What about it, women's department? Men's department? Praise the Lord. What about it, saints? What about it, music department? Choir uh, leaders, singers, musicians, workers? How many of us serve out of a sense of indebtedness? What about it, administration? What about it, pastors? What about it, workers? How many of us are motivated by a sense of indebtedness? That, that not that the world owes us, but that we owe them. Praise the Lord. Are we motivated by a sense of indebtedness to the Lord, or are we motivated by gain? and popularity, and fame? Do we serve as uh, the church as though we're doing the church a favor? Well, you ought to be glad that I showed up. Well, you ought to be glad that I'm here. You better thank God that I volunteered to work with the youth department. You ought to be glad that I'm willing to be a volunteer. Where is that sense of indebtedness? I'm going to preach after a while. Praise the Lord. All of us want to be praised as though we're doing God a favor. I volunteer my time. But if you're not volunteering from a sense of being indebted, God won't bless you for your volunteerism. Amen. Indebted to who, preacher? First of all, indebted to the Lord for his goodness to us. Everybody in here who's saved ought to say, I owe God. See, that, that thing ought to resonate in your mind. I owe the Lord. Well, owing for what, preacher? First of all, for saving you. Some of us have been in sin. All of us, really. But some of us know we've been in sin. No, that, that, that bullet in the club could have had our name on it. No, that, that accident we were in, we could have gotten killed. Praise the Lord. Some of us know that it was, were it not for the grace of God, we would not be where we are today. And that it, we know, we know, we know. Let me be honest, some of us know we should be in jail. Just didn't get caught. Now, folk locked up for doing more, less than we did, but the Lord had mercy. I want to remind you, see, we've come from somewhere, but there ought to be a sense of payback, giving back to God for the goodness that the Lord has shown toward us. Your mama wasn't the best. Your daddy was nowhere to be found and God made you somebody. You were sitting there, praise the Lord, and you got through college some kind of way. Have a degree and baby don't have a degree but you got a good job. Praise the Lord. You put things in your body that should have shut your kidneys down. That should have uh, stopped your heart. You did things that, that could have killed you. But, and you're sitting there with perfect health. There ought to be a sense of indebtedness. Praise the Lord. No, y'all to have AIDS. In Atlanta, especially in Atlanta downtown, Atlanta proper, the report came out, every 51 person, one out of every 51 downtown Atlanta is HIV. There's an outbreak. And some of us have been out there and sinned with drugs and needles, with women and men. And yet the Lord somehow took care of us and now here we are in heavenly places and yet feel no sense of indebtedness. Forgave us for the abortion. Filled us with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Forgave us for the adultery. Forgave you for the fornication. Forgave for lying and stealing in some cases, killing. And yet there 
is no sense of indebtedness. Somebody tonight ought to say, God, I owe you. You're giving me, you're giving me legs that work. You're giving me a voice that work. Taking me, I was headed nowhere fast from the wrong side of the tracks, and you raised me up. See, uh, it's going to dawn on uh, some of us. Cause see, see, some of us feel as though, well, the Lord really didn't bring us from uh, anywhere. But yes, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He let you survive that bad marriage when that man was hitting you upside the head. He let you survive, praise the Lord, a home where you had an abusive father, an abusive mother. He let you survive things. And then for some of us, he just kept all that stuff away from us. None of those things came to our doorstep. God blocked us from all of that. Why, you're indebted. Oh, pastor, I don't know the, I don't owe the Lord anything because my mama was saved, my daddy was saved, I came up in a, in a Christian home. No, you are indebted more than anybody else because he spared you all that stuff. Good God Almighty, he kept it all away. There ought to be something in us that says, I am a debtor. Ask God to forgive you for being so comfortable. Well, I have a question for you. Are you indebted? Do you have a sense of indebtedness to the God of the Bible? to the human race, to those who are lost and who do not know Jesus Christ. Do you have a sense of indebtedness to share the truth of God, even about this rainbow, to share the truth of God, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us, rose again the third day, and salvation is for everyone. Listen, as I said in the message, I owe God. He's been too good to me, and frankly, my friends, whether you know it or not, you owe him also. I want to encourage every one of you, share the gospel. Tell people about the love of God. Let people know about the meaning of these colors, that the God of the Bible put a beautiful bow in the sky to remind himself not to destroy the earth with water, and it is a promise to us that no matter how bad the, the weather gets, God will not flood the earth again. I'll tell you something as we go off the air. The very next day after we preach this particular message, over the church, and I've got several pictures that were sent to me, over the church, there was a rainbow in the sky. What a mighty God we serve. Join me next week at the same time on this same station. Thanks for watching. Experience this message in its entirety by calling toll free 877 463 3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.